Hello, friends. Welcome in. It's just past high noon. May I be the first to say a good afternoon to you and yours. Hope you're doing well. It's 12.05 to be precise. This Tuesday, April 16, 2024, it's Super Talk 99.7 WTN. You probably knew that. It is episode 553 of our proceedings today. During our portion of the broadcast, I hope you're able to spend every single moment of us or, uh, of it with us on Super Talk 99.7. Thank you for being here. Lots to get into, lots to discuss. Bell Kay's behind the glass, making sure that everything that comes out of our speakers sounds as good as humanly possible. We appreciate that uh, from him. Uh, you may get in on the conversation at any point of your choosing, 615-737-9986, 615-737-WWTN. That's also the membersnutrition.com super text line, and we give those numbers often and as quickly as possible just to keep you on your toes. And a lot to keep you on your toes tonight, uh, today, nationally, uh, internationally, uh, obviously locally. We've got some news statewide. We've got some news as well. And we appreciate your commentary on each and every one of those things. Let's start here. It appears, without it being in the ground, without it being in the crematorium, that the education, wh whatever you feel about it, that the education scholarship bill is dead. All of my sources are indicating to me that that is the case now, that they cannot get a secure vote in the House committee on the matter. I have been in communication with Representative Scott Sapicki, who was the lead voice in the legislation in the House of Representatives. He will be on the show tomorrow afternoon. He could not do it today. He'll be on tomorrow afternoon at 1 o'clock. He'll spend the entire hour with us. And we will dissect what is either the resurrection. I mean, if this thing comes, let, let's put it this way. If this thing comes back to life, I will refer to it as the Lazarus bill. Because I think it, it, it's to bed right now. We will either be discussing by tomorrow, I expect, what happened and what went wrong and what impasse could not be overcome, or we will be discussing the resurrection of the legislation. I've been told by multiple sources uh, that, and, and I'm, I'm not, you guys know where I am on it. I don't really have a dog or a pony in the fight, except that I pay taxes. And I would expect that my taxes would go to better educational opportunities for Tennessee students. Sadly, the public education system is a failing system. It's a failing system primarily because it is a monopoly. It has no competition, and it is run by the government. Most anything that's run by the government is going to fail. Even when it has competition, oftentimes those things run by the government fails. Look at, oh, I don't know, the U.S. Postal Service as an example. So my interest is to better educational opportunities for all Tennessee students. And I believe the only way you do that is to infuse a level of competition not currently that doesn't currently exist in public education. And in doing so, as long as the, the attitudes either have to change regarding that competition or obviously the public education system will get worse, which is what I think Scott Sapicki was talking about when he referred to blowing the system up and starting again from scratch. He wasn't talking about destroying public education, for goodness sake. Although that's not off the table for me either. So my interest, and uh, understand my intent, you can agree or disagree with how we accomplish that goal. That's all well and good. But my intent is to better the educational opportunities for Tennessee students. Tennessee students in private school, Tennessee students in public school, Tennessee students that are homeschooled. I want the best educational opportunities for all students. And I believe that this would go a long way to accomplish that. There's plenty of things to hate about it, uh, but I think that there are more things to like about it. You guys know where I am on it. Some of you agree with me. Some of you disagree. We took a recent poll, and it was, what, 30, something like 39 to 27. I think that's about right. Uh, it was 39, yes, we're in favor of this. 27, no, we're not in favor of that informal poll that we did on the show about a week ago. But what is my understanding is that in committee, uh, Representative Jeremy Faison has decided to vote against the legislation and that he was a needed vote in order to get it out of committee. I invited Representative Faison on the show, and I'll simply read to you 
the the text exchange. Can you come on the show tomorrow? We can talk in the morning beforehand if you'd like. I don't want to argue with you about your position or anything. I just want to get your rationale behind where you are on all of this. Would love to have you. That is to Representative Faison. And his response was, the education bill has left some really raw emotions right now. Probably not a good time for me to talk about it on the air. And I said, I understand. Maybe later this week or next. And he said, good. Right on is what he said, actually. So eventually we'll get his thoughts on it. But I uh, just wanted you to have the information, the intelligence that I have so far on the ground in the General Assembly in the Tennessee legislature. It's the biggest piece of legislation. And there are other pieces of legislation that matter. We'll have Gino Bolso on tomorrow at 12, well, 12, 15 or so uh, to discuss his flag bill, which is expected to come up for a vote at some point tonight. I think that's correct. Uh, but uh, this is the biggest piece of legislation uh, that's been going on in the General Assembly that would affect a, a, a decent amount of Tennessee students, 20,000, up to 20,000 Tennessee students. And it looks like it will not be happening this session. Um, this was a, um, a major piece of the governor's agenda. This se Now, look, I don't want to cast it dead yet, although every piece of information I'm getting is indicating that it is. But can you revive it? Can you put some paddles to it? Pop that thing, get the flat line going? I don't know. That's not up to me. That's up to the uh, proponents of the bill. And we'll find out. Or, you know what? And frankly, it might be up to you to a certain degree. I would imagine that if enough of you uh, find out where your representatives are on the legislation prior to the vote and you get to those representatives, I mean, voices matter. Collective voices matter. So, I mean, if you want to hit up your representative and it happens to be Jeremy Faison and tell him that you support it, all, all well and good. If you decide that you don't want to do that and you believe that Jeremy Faison is right in his opposition to it, that, I'm just letting you know. I'm just, I'm just here, baby, reporting the news. And at this point, the news is that the education bill is dead and that the, the primary, I mean, to a certain degree, it's like saying that a swing vote on the Supreme Court is the one and singular thing that pushed a matter one way or the, the other. I mean, the other votes matter, too, obviously. Uh, but this was the swing vote that swung it in the wrong direction. In the meantime, Donald Trump is on trial a uh, day two of jury selection in the uh, in the Trump hush money trial, as it's being called, is ongoing. Uh, CNN has absolute. I, mean, I am so amused by the manner in which they cover this. Uh, the the fact that CNN hashtag never CNN. I I call it hashtag never CNN because I never want you to watch this garbage network. It's a garbage network full of garbage people. One of which is not Charles Barkley anymore. I I don't know if you saw that. You know Barkley was doing that weekend show with Gail King. Because somebody thought that it was a great name. King. Hey, guys, we could call it King Charles and we could get Gail King and Charles Barkley and it'll be all cool because, you know, Charles is the king now over in England. And you see how it works on multiple levels. Ha 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 ha. Instead, it just came off like they were ripping off LeBron. Well, it. I watched an episode of the show. It sucked. I mean, I don't care how cute your name is. If the show sucks, I've had Chuck on the show on multiple occasions. I did a radio show 30 miles from where he grew up. Charles Barkley has been on my show. I, I like the guy for what it's worth. But I learned early on, if you scratch the surface of his knowledge on politics very deeply, you come up with air. You come up with nothing. And so I would have predicted to you, and I think I did, that this thing is going nowhere. I mean, one, people don't traditionally watch these deep dive political shows on the weekends, although I will sample Mark Levin from time to time on Fox News. That said, the show just wasn't very good. It had no depth of knowledge, and so it's dead. But anyway. Well, what do you know, you dope? What do you know? Hey, 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 what, what are you talking about? <laughs> My, he, he said he liked my show. Fox News Sunday evenings. Tune in. And I'm on this radio station at 7 o'clock tonight. You dope. So, uh, one way or the other, CNN has decided, I mean, just decided uh, that they're going to go all in on this coverage because hashtag never CNN, 
has decided since 2016 uh, that it, it is their singular goal to get Trump. And because of that, uh, they've gone into the crapper in terms of ratings because no one can believe uh, that they're getting the real news from CNN, especially when it comes to presidential politics. So that's ongoing. We'll give you the, I mean, I don't know that there's any update. It's jury selection, for goodness sake. They're asking them a series of questions. Donald Trump is sitting in the courtroom glaring at them. The big news yesterday afternoon was apparently that Donald Trump fell asleep. Ha, 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 Donald Trump fell asleep. So what? I promise you, it's a fall asleep worthy event. I've been in a courtroom. I've seen jury selection. I don't know if you've ever seen. It's boring. The only people interested are these prospective jurors and the people involved with selecting them. And they're asking the same questions over and over. And I'm certain that for a while there, Donald Trump was glaring at them uh, to try to pierce through their souls to see if they were pro or anti-Trump or neutral on the matter. I don't know that they'll get one jury juror or willing to nullify the jury i mean uh, you're you're dealing with a uh, you're dealing with a prosecutor that ran on the concept of getting trump you're dealing with a case that involves federal charges that the federal government themselves refused to file you're dealing with alvin bragg who initially refused to file the charges he was then pressured into doing so by former prosecutors in the new york area and worried that he would be run out of town on a rail if he did not prosecute, and so he decided to do so. He shackled together state law and federal law and a state charge and a federal charge in an effort to create a felony out of a misdemeanor. All of this is on the record, by the way. You can look all of it up. So all of it's a, a rather convoluted dog and pony show. Oh, by the way, Donald Trump is accused of doing exactly the same thing that John Edwards did that Bill Clinton did. Now, I don't know if Donald Trump was guilty like those other two. I mean, Jonathan Edwards, we have physical evidence of his guilt in as much as he bore a baby out of his illicit affair. Bill Clinton, he just had George Stephanopoulos, the magnanimous one, and James Carville paying off woman after woman after woman. Bimbo eruptions, they called them. And they, they I mean, folks, Donald Trump is not accused of using campaign contributions to do this. He used his own money. The basis of all of this, the basis of this entire accusation is that instead of filing this as hush money for a porn actress, Donald Trump filed it as a retainer for his attorney. That's it. And as a result, here we are. Spending untold amounts of money of New York City's money, money that New York City doesn't have, by the way, in an effort to stop Trump's reelection campaign, which is what all of this is about. And I beg of you, if you consider this case, and it will get lumbering at some point, it will get moving forward at some point. After jury selection happens, then you'll start getting the liar Michael Cohen on the stand and Hope Hicks on the stand and others. And once that occurs, oh, it'll be gangbusters. It'll be the trial of the century as some are referring to it. And maybe you'll tune in. And I just want you to have a basis of understanding of what's truly going on there. So we've got that going on and we'll discuss it. We will talk about death to America at some point today. Uh, we have people in this country that are screaming death to America in the United States of America. And I want to know what you want to do with those folks. Because I, what I would like to do with those folks is just irrationally, and I don't care how we accomplish it, just send them somewhere else. I don't, I don't care where. I don't care how. Just if you, if you, you have one opportunity, I'm, I'm going to tell, I'm going to tell you my, my theory as to how we should treat these individuals. I'm talking about the ones that are stopping traffic all over the United States of America, Golden Gate Bridge, Chicago, Illinois, other parts of the country, demanding this, that, or the other thing when it comes to the Palestinians and the uh, Israelis. You say death to America, you've got one shot to explain to me why you get to stay here. Otherwise, you're out. In the meantime, it is a Tuesday edition of the Matt Murphy Show on Super Talk 99.7 WTN. Here's how you listen, 99.7 FM. You can also listen on a variety of streaming platforms of your choosing. Um, and you can do so by dialing up those streaming platforms at your leisure. You may also watch on Super Talk TV, YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Twitch, episode 553 is entitled.
Well, I kind of went a little uh, different this today because uh, I don't know if you saw Chris uh, Hand's title. I did not. Uh, it was basically Mac bragging because he bothered to show up to work. Uh huh. Because uh, he hadn't been there for a couple of days, so I I changed ours and our, ours is Matt Murphy and Bell Kay on the job, Mac Morey slacking as usual. Uh, that's true. I mean, there's no Morey right now, right? No, there's no Morey right now. Hmm. He'll be back though. He'll be back. We'll ask him his response. We'll see if we can get a robust retort from yeah. Mac Morey coming up at two o'clock on Super Talk ninety nine seven WT. And there you go. Super Talk TV is up and running for you masochist and the listening audience. A reminder, Mayor Glenn Jacobs coming up at twelve thirty today at Super Talk ninety nine seven WTN six one five seven three seven ninety nine eighty six. Stand by. Hey, folks, it's Matt Murphy. The Dr. Gill Center for Back, Neck, and Chronic Pain Relief is located in Franklin. I've told my story before, but I'll tell it again. I had some lower back issues and an upper neck issue, and I didn't really know what was going on. So as soon as I got to Nashville and learned about the Dr. Gill Center, I went over to see Dr. Gill, met him, saw Dr. Wendy. She gave me a full examination. For less than $50, you can have this too, $49. Uh, they will walk you through your paces. They'll give you a full examination. They'll get some x-rays from you, uh, find out where it hurts and why it hurts, more importantly. And then they will offer you a plan of action that can succeed in alleviating your pain without having to constantly take pills, without having to take shots, and without having to consider surgery. And that's what it's all about, is avoiding surgery at all costs, alleviating the pain in a more natural way. They do so with spinal decompression. Uh, they've got their Class 5 laser system, their red light therapy for soft tissue issues, all at the Dr. Gill Center. I'm proud to note I don't have upper neck issues anymore. I had a spinal compression in my upper neck. We got it decompressed, and we, we've taken care of it. Uh, the lower back, it flares up from time to time, and off I go to the Dr. Gill Center to get relief, and you can get relief as well. Make the call that so many others have made, or make the short drive to Franklin, the Dr. Gill Center for Back, Neck, and Chronic Pain Relief. Don't take a pill. Call Dr. Gill, 615-882-4838, 882-4838 for the Dr. Gill Center. 
All right. Here we go. Super Talk 99.7 WTN. Man, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of famous people in town today. This fellow Rachel Levine is over at Vanderbilt University. We'll talk about him uh, later. I, I, I've, I have a longstanding policy that if you're a grown-up and you spend an, ex, an extended amount of time, if you're a male grown-up, you're born a male, you spend an extended amount of time in a dress, I'm not calling you a she until you show me a little commitment, you know, and uh, you show me a little commitment to your uh, gender switch, and I'm happy to show you some commitment by calling you a woman. Otherwise, um, you're still a guy. Anyway, that's that's coming up later on in the show. I just did that to get the reaction that I absolutely got from our next guest. Mayor Glenn Jacobs joins us in studio. <laughs> What's to big to big applause to much applause? I mean, Aaron, Aaron Gulbrandson is here too, but whatever. Uh, I'm not that important. So. What an what, hold on, you turned on one mic. I figured you had both of them on there, Bell. Okay, thank you very much. You too busy hugging people over there. Hello, That's Mayor. Right. Yeah, I don't know if we need to be talking about hugging after you talk about Rachel. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. I just did that for the look. Oh no, he was over. Uh, he was over at Vanderbilt earlier. I, I don't. I don't know what they're doing over there. Um, I don't yeah. know. Well, can we ho move on, please? Yeah, we can. <laughs> Hello, you. Mayor. How are you? Hey, how are you doing? I'm good. Good. It's good to good. see you in studio, man. Yeah, it's nice to be here. It's the first time I've ever been in studio with you. I, I believe that is the case. Yes, we've, it is. we've had an opportunity to talk on many occasions, but first time in studio. I know you were. Uh, uh, you were over in uh, home base, uh, Knox County, earlier today for the Men of Valor Function. The last time I saw you was in Nashville at the Men of Valor Function. Is yes. that an organization? I mean, obviously, you, you are affiliated with this organization. What a wonderful group of people. <laughs> they do there. great work. They opened their campus in Knoxville about three years ago. This morning, they had about 650 people at this breakfast, which is a huge turnout. We're really happy about that. But, yeah, they do tremendous work. And it's it's the way that we say that we want it, right? Uh, that they they work with the government, right? Uh, they don't uh, th they don't keep their hand out to government. I mean, that it's our donations that make that possible for them. Uh, but they work through government in our prison system to reduce the taxpayer burden uh, by reducing recidivism. That's right. I absolutely love it. That's right. It's amazing statistic. You know, recidivism across the state runs up to seventy five percent. Right. And if someone goes through the men of our program for a year, that drops to single digits. Mm -hmm. And the beauty of that, that means less crime and fewer victims, fewer people getting hurt. So I think that's something we can all get behind. You have a uh, you brought in a championship belt with you. What is up with this? I like yeah. that. Yeah, it's very uh, show nice. That, show that camera right there. That camera right there. Ah. Show that camera. Yes. OK. okay. Is, well, OK. With which camera? Yeah, yeah, you're good. Ah, you're fine. The there one over there, there, there with the green there light. Is. There it is. Yes. So this is a Defender of Freedom Award from the Faith and Freedom Coalition. That's pretty cool. It is. What? I can add it to my collection of belts. <laughs> you got you got one or two. Of I those, do. Right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, Aaron Gulbrinson, you guys are doing this uh, annually. I think you offer these to. Uh, uh, well, tell me the criteria that you look for in a Defender of Freedom. Defender of Freedom is somebody in the state of Tennessee that uh, is an elected official that most ardently defends the rights, freedoms, and prosperity of uh, Tennesseans. It's as if I've said that numerous times yeah, today I think and yesterday. So. I think so, and so Glenn Jacobs is a recipient. What uh, what made uh, Glenn the perfect type of candidate that you want to give a defender? I'm of just freedom perfect. Award? You said it. I'm just right. perfect. That's why. <laughs> Honestly, he's the be he's the best county mayor in the state. Um, he consistently uh, shows an intelligent conservatism. Governs the county wonderfully. He's a model for other mayors around the state, uh, and will frankly will never forget the ardent defense of the Constitution and the citizens of Knox County that he did during COVID. Well, and yours is not an easy lift in Knox County because you're dealing with Knoxville, right? And walk me through, I remember the first time we talked, you tried to help me with this dynamic sure. because I was brand new in the right, state. Right, right. And, um, and it's, for newbies, it's a little weird. Like, wait a minute, you're the mayor of Knox County, but you're not the mayor of Knoxville. Right. So you have to deal with uh, some more liberal-minded people in Knoxville, right? Sure. And in Tennessee, we have county mayors, which does sound weird because you normally associate that with cities. But really, we have the same role as a city mayor just outside of the city. In Knox County, we have the city of Knoxville and the town of Farragut, our, our municipalities. And yes... We do more in Farragut. They have very limited scope of what they do. But the city of Knoxville, I mean, it's full-blown. They're their own government and do mostly their own stuff. 
All right, and uh, and it's do you get uh, do you get some of that backlash sometimes from people not not understanding? Yes, I do, uh, and we actually work pretty well with the city. There's certain things that we disagree on, and we just agree to disagree on those things. Sure. We work together where we can, but it's always funny how people on Twitter be like, "Oh, you did this." I was like, "Well, that was actually the city, and I have no purview <laughs> over that particular decision." But thanks for your feedback. <laughs> Uh, well, let's take a quick break, and when we come back, I want to ask you about some of the things going on uh, across the state of Tennessee and maybe even a little more globally and sure. across the United States of America. Mayor Glenn Jacobs is in studio with us along with Aaron Gulbrinson uh, with the Tennessee Faith and Freedom Coalition. Quick time out back in a moment on Super Talk. Hey, folks, Tennessee Men's Clinic, for you men out there that are feeling less energetic, less motivated to get to the gym, less motivated to get outside and work in the yard, or, and I'm going to just say it, man, less motivated in the bedroom, Tennessee Men's Clinic is your place to go. They are a men-centric clinic with qualified urologists available for you. They'll check you out. They'll get some blood work. They'll see what's going on inside of your body. Now, naturally, uh, men produce less of certain things that give you that energy and that drive and that motivation over your life. Uh, one of that's your T-level. If your T-level begins to drop uh, to certain zones, then you're going to feel that lack of energy. You're going to feel grumpy. You're not going to feel motivated to get to the gym or whatnot. And that's going to create problems, I'm telling you, in your life and potentially in your love life. is If this is the case, why not schedule an appointment? It's a low-cost point to you. They'll go in, uh, two locations to serve you. One's in Midtown. Uh, Evan started that clinic in 2014. Uh, the other in Cool Springs, and that opened up last year. And they'll uh, walk you through it, and they'll see what's going on in your body, and then they'll get a plan of action ready to, uh, and available to you to get you back to that energy level uh, that you need. 615-208-9090. 615-208-9090. It's TennesseeMensClinic.com. TennesseeMensClinic.com.
Hello, folks. Dr. Poss and the Sleep Apnea and TMJ Solution Center helped me in so many different ways. And I'm going to tell you how. So I've, I've been talking about Dr. Poss for two years now. And one day, Dr. Poss and I are talking. And this was actually at a, a Super Talk 99.7 WTN event. And he said, Matt, do you have sleep apnea? And I said, no, Dr. Poss, I don't snore that much. And he goes, uh, or do you feel tired? And I said, yeah, sometimes. He goes, I think you should take a sleep study. I did. And I found out that I'm one of the 25% of adults in America that had sleep apnea, and I was unaware of it. And I don't snore that much, which is also a rarity with sleep apnea, uh, but it was a fact with me. And so I became a client. Uh, I was already a spokesperson. Now I'm a client of Dr. Stephen Poss and the Sleep Apnea and TMJ Solution Center. And I got to tell you, uh, when I use my appliance, I feel more refreshed. I feel better in the morning, and I don't snore at all. When I don't use the appliance, I don't feel as refreshed. I don't feel as energetic in the mornings because I'm not getting the night's sleep uh, that I should get. And for most individuals that have sleep apnea, they're snoring, and they're preventing their sleeping partner from sleeping as well. So it's all about your health, and it's all about your good night's sleep. Dr. Poss and the Sleep Apnea and TMJ Solution Center. Find out more. There are two locations to serve you in Brentwood and Murfreesboro. And remember, they're in network with all of the major insurance companies in the state of Tennessee. So your insurance is going to take care of of most of the costs of your sleep appliance with Dr. Stephen Poss. DrPoss.com. That's D-R-P-O-S-S dot com. Back after it, Super Talk 99.7, WTN, Matt Murphy and you, and a full studio. Uh, we've got Aaron Gulbrunson of the Tennessee Faith and Freedom Coalition, and, um, and you know, enough about him. Mayor Glenn Jacobs is in studio with us uh, this afternoon, uh, joining us um, as we, uh, thank you, Bell, as we, Continue talking with the mayor. So here, here's my question, okay? You're okay. Right? What's up with what? What's up with you and the and the governor's office? So you said he was going to say that. Mm -hmm. He just it's just passed his pro. Oh, you mean visiting the governor this morning? <laughs> no, running yes. for office. No, oh. Yes, that's exactly what I mean. Visit. <laughs> yeah, you did. You visit the you visited I did, the governor. Yeah, we stopped by to say hello to the governor. Yeah, presented how, him. Presented him with an award. Great. Great. Went really well. I haven't seen him in a few weeks. So you're going to run, up. right? I, I, well, I was in the office You're going to allow morning. us. You're going to allow us. Seat. You're going to allow us the privilege of saying our bulldog. next mayor, Look, correct? Was our the, next uh, governor. I was the bulldog. I thought I was. Yeah. Wow. I, man, he's I coming get it from all sides here. I, like, hey, Glenn, I, vote right here. Ready to throw one down. Ready for, <laughs> got a vote. Ready to do it. I mean, if he announces on our show, he's got my vote. Might He's got little, mine regardless. Might be a little too early yeah. for that. I mean, yeah, it's I, a little too the, early. Look, the, the word uh, that everyone here, you get it. I mean, you've sure. heard all of this. A lot of people are excited about the possibility that you're considering running for governor. Well, I'm flattered by that. I really am. Um, but right now, you know, I still have two and a half years left as Knox County mayor. So my main priority is being the best Knox County mayor that I can be. How do you feel like, if you ever were to make that decision down the road, how do you feel like you would be as a governor? Is, is it similar in, in nature to the way that you've managed Knox County? I think so. You know, obviously the scale's much larger. Our budget in Knox County is about, uh, it is about a billion dollars now. We're not a little bitty place. We have 500,000 people. There's 7 million in the state of Tennessee with a budget now of over $50 billion. Uh, and there's a lot of things that the governor deals with that as local mayor we don't deal with. So, but I think some of the fundamentals as far as working with, you know, I, I'm a peer executive. I don't sit on county commission. I think some of the fundamentals as far as working with the legislature and those sort of things are probably very similar, just a much, much larger scale. When you look around the state, when you talk to people around the state, I know you're always moving and shaking and going to different communities. Um, what are the priorities of the people of the state of Tennessee that you hear about? Tennessee's in a wonderful place. And uh, I think that one thing that we kind of take for granted here is yesterday we all paid federal income tax. Mm -hmm. And obviously in Tennessee, we don't have an income tax, a state income tax. And I think that really helps us. Uh, you know, but it's it's just like everyone else around the country in the conservative areas. You know, we have a lot of people moving here from the blue areas. Uh, and how are we dealing with that? Ensuring that we keep our quality of life high, that our political philosophy here in the state of Tennessee, which has served us so well over the past decade or so, that that doesn't change. Uh, and, you know, I think it's just that quality of life of, of Tennessee still being Tennessee. Do you think that we are experiencing, I, I think to a lesser degree than some other states and some other major metropolitan areas, but are you concerned 
in Knox County specifically, Knoxville, Nashville, Memphis, some of the crime that we're seeing. And sadly, I think on the back end of it, it's exacerbating some of that crime because we don't see our local district attorneys <laughs> doing everything necessary to keep these criminals behind bars. We don't have that issue as far as district attorneys in Knox County. We have a very strong district attorney general. So that's something that we don't deal with. Crime, unfortunately, across the country is going on. And, you know, you see what's happening in Memphis, and that's an awful situation, uh, as well as here in Nashville. Police uh, officers know, shot on. Yeah, it's, and it's, killed on it's, it's, it's just absolutely terrible. Um, but again, you know, in, in, in Knox County, we have a strong sheriff. We have a strong DA. Um, the Knoxville Police Department actually does a really good job as well. Uh, so, yeah, we have the crime, but we're not facing almost the crisis like they are in the Nashville area, or that, excuse me, the Memphis area. You, you, I want to circle back to the uh, yesterday, April 15th, and, and us paying our federal taxes. Are we getting our money's worth? <laughs> See, that's what I'm here for. Just <laughs> Sorry. Throw Jacobs the socks. <laughs> throw Jacobs the softballs. <laughs> no, no, absolutely not. I mean, the, the federal government's just a basket case right now. I mean, just everything is just, you know, it's just all politics and things are falling apart around the country. You're just talking about crime. Well, so much of that is a result of policies coming out of Washington. We got $35 trillion national debt. I mean, we pay so much money into the federal government and then they still can't cover all the bills. So when I look at Washington, I just shake my head. I think it's, it is. It's just an absolute basket case. I mean, what does Tennessee do to better insulate, or can Tennessee do anything to better insulate itself from the poor policies of D.C., right? I mean, a, a lot of times folks will call in, and they're being critical of Governor Bill Lee. Right. And I understand their frustration. They're saying, why are we letting these illegal aliens come into Tennessee? And, uh, you know, you try to explain the nuance of yeah. the federal and the state. What, what do you say to Walmart? Yeah, well, like with the, the legal immigration issue, no one from the federal government even talks to us. Right. When Donald Trump was in the White House, uh, we actually had regular conversations with his Department of Intergovernmental, Intergovernmental Affairs. That doesn't happen under Biden. We have literally have no idea what's going on. The State Department doesn't tell us anything. Homeland Security doesn't tell us anything. And, you know, some of these issues, it's like the feds just act like, well, we can do whatever we want, and we're the only game in town. Um, one of the things that Donald Trump was really good at, that even some folks on the left will acknowledge was their communication with state and local governments was outstanding. Biden, it's just like this top down, you're going to do this, and we're not even really going to tell you what's going on. And it's incredibly frustrating because people ask me those same questions, and I'm like, literally like, I don't know. I don't know. I, I talked to our congressman. He doesn't know. I talked to our senators. They don't know. And when you talk to When you talk to local law enforcement in Knox County, and, and I think we could extend this statewide, but I'll, I'll focus on your county. Uh, have, you, ha, have your law enforcement officials noticed – an uptick in interactions with illegal aliens. I mean, I know that there's there's only so much that they can right. do, uh, but have they noticed that they're interacting more? I, I don't think so much they are. Um, now, we're a 287G community, which means that our deputies are deputized by ICE, so they can actually... Uh, they arrest powers. Yeah, 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 they do, and they can turn people over. Where we see it more is things like schools and other services, uh, especially you know big influx of Spanish-speaking kids to our area, which puts an enormous burden on our school system because that's just more money that they have to pay to have people that specialize in uh, whatever language. So that's probably where we see it the most. You mentioned schools. Um, there's a lot of debate as to whether or not this education scholarship bill that the governor has been pushing is alive or dead. Uh, I think it's teetering. I think it's going it, to, I think we'll figure it out at some point over the next week or so, uh, whether or not it survives committee. Um, have you thought a lot about this? Have you talked to your constituents? Where are they on this? School choice uh, among Republicans is very popular. In fact, it's a platform of the Republican National Committee. Um, the issue is in some of the smaller areas, you know, they see their schools being harmed by this by funding being transferred somewhere else, um, we would be impacted more in Knox County because we're such a big community. We have a lot of private schools. We have uh, a lot of opportunities for that. Um, so for me, I think it's very important because we're a country that's supposed to be about freedom of choice, right? People get to choose 
how they spend their money, um, how they raise their kids, and all those sort of things. Uh, school choice is a great example of that. You know, the fact that it's and it's not just private school versus public school. It's, for instance, my brother is an auto mechanic. He went to Votex school, right? Um, those opportunities are just not really there in the public school system at this point because we've really taken so much of that out. Um, so for me, it's just about expanding the opportunity for young people to be exposed to different career pathways, right? Um, and I, I, I'm just, I'm myself, I'm a big school choice proponent for that reason. And I think what we do is we boil it down to, oh, it's public versus private. No, it's about options and opportunities for young people, it's how we should view it. Mayor Glenn Jacobs is in studio with us for a few more moments, talking with him about a variety of issues, including Knox County, the state of Tennessee, and the United States of America. You know, we, we for the it seems like there's been a shift. I've been doing this for almost a quarter century. Uh, and over the last five years, there's been such a, a cultural shift with regard to um, individuals grow. I mean, the transgender issues, DEI issues, and these sorts of things. Um, and it's one thing for the culture to try to figure out where it is on it. The government seems to be infiltrating this conversation and getting involved in it. Um, when we first had a conversation, I kind of bonded with you because I I'm, I call myself a small L libertarian. I don't belong to the party, but I believe sure. in that basic philosophy right. of government. Right. And I think you do too. Yes. Um, wh where should government be on all of this? I mean, it, it's that line between leaving families alone versus protecting the rights of the most vulnerable right. of our citizens. Right. Well, when we look at things like, you know, the, the sex change procedures, and I do not call them gender affirming, okay, because we're right. talking about sex change procedures. You know, um, I believe that what the General Assembly has done there is perfectly acceptable and something that needs to happen. You know, when if you're not 18 years old and people are making decisions that are permanent for you, that's very harmful. So I think the, the government should step in there. You know, a lot of these things, uh, what happens though is government ends up pushing this down our throats, right? You know, the, the, the extreme left um, folks on that I would in the past have kind of would have considered kind of moderate. Well, now they're, they're pandering so much to the extreme left that we're getting some of these crazy ideas uh, and they're just permeating everything. And then they literally are pushing those. Uh, so, you know, for the most part, we need to stay out of that stuff, but you're exactly right. We need to protect kids. And I th think our general assembly here has done a really good job of that. Uh, you're obviously a supporter of Donald Trump for president yes. in 2024. I just got a, a text message on the membersnutrition.com super text line that says Todd writes in and, and he gets it. Uh, and I love this. He says, you need to run for president in 2028. <laughs> I, I, I love that. I just said I just said Washington D.C. is a basket case. <laughs> but if you if you were president for I mean if you were president for a day have you have you studied enough about what needs to be done at the southern border? I mean, is it as simple as re-implementing Donald Trump's policies? Yeah, his policies worked really well. Also, we we really the whole, to me we can't have a discussion about illegal immigration without also talking about welfare reform. And eliminating all of this magnet that people come mm -hmm. here for, you know. Um, so, but if you look at what Trump did, it was absolutely working. Then Biden turns around, reverses it all. We have this huge crisis. And then he turns around and says, it's all Trump's fault. No, dude, it's your <laughs> fault. You you caused all of this to happen. Um, you know, and then you look at so many of the other issues that we face. And, and really, it's just a lack of political will to do the right thing. That's just it. Thank you, Mr. President. You we appreciate that. Uh, so in, in a couple of minutes we have left, I'd be remiss if I didn't I didn't press a little bit on this. So what is your process? I know you're focused on Knox County, uh, but so many folks have to express uh, their desire uh, that you cast your hat into a larger ring, governor or whatnot. Um, what is your process moving forward about how you how you process that? You you I know you hear it. I know you see it on a regular basis. I know you have to appreciate it. Uh, how do you respond to it moving forward? Well, I do appreciate it, and you know the fact that folks would say that, um, based on my track record as Knox County Mayor, makes me very proud. You know that that, that they think I'm competent enough to do that job. Uh, there's really two things. First of all. And I did the same thing when I thought about running for mayor. You know, I I grew up and my family didn't have a whole lot. And 
I got an opportunity and I was able to just live an unbelievable life thanks to the American dream, right? And for me, it's all about that. It's all about protecting that dream for the next generation. Um, where can I do that best? Where I'd be best at that? What, where, what position would my skill set be best utilized? Okay, so you have that side, but then you also have the personal side. Uh, you know, my family and they're all involved in this. Um, when I started getting out of wrestling, my wife's like, hey, you're going to be home all the time. Well, not so much. <laughs> uh, so, you know, and I would like to enjoy more time with them as well. And uh, I don't want to say it's a sacrifice because it's something you choose to do. But at the same time, you know, you do lose some things when you decide to do stuff like this. So it's really a balancing act between, okay, where would I best serve whoever, the people of Tennessee, t people of Knox County, and on the other hand, you know, will that interfere with my family? Uh, is it something that my family can get behind? Um, my wife has always been very supportive of everything that I've done. She doesn't necessarily like this gig because that's just not her thing. Um, but she's always been supportive uh, with everything throughout my entire life. Uh, but at the same time, you know, I, I owe it to them to to really take into account how this could impact them. I, I want to explore one 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 little thing you said. You, you talked about running for mayor of Knox County. I mean, what, what was the specific? Was there something specific or was it just a general feeling of wanting to give back? It was a general feeling of I think I could do some good here. Right. And, and that was really it. Yeah, I didn't. I mean, it, <laughs> like you, you know, I'm a very small government person, so I'm pretty much mad about everything the government does all, all right. the time. So it wasn't like I could point to one issue. Uh, but at the same time, Knox County, much like Tennessee, was in a really good spot. Congressman Tim Burchett, who was mayor, had done a good job. Um, I very much agree with Tim's political philosophy. You look at the state of Tennessee, we're in a great position because we've had great leadership. Um, and that kind of also makes things easier. And then in Knox County, too, I mean, I think like 90% of Knox County, 80% of Knox Countyans do. Um, so it, it's actually easy for me. I was talking to someone the other day, uh, and I told him, look, I couldn't do this job in some areas of the country because it would just be miserable all the time. Uh, whereas here in Knox County, these are my people, right? And and I we, we agree on almost everything. It is a, it is a special, politi uh, I almost said politician, and I, I think it's almost a dirty way to talk about you, but it's a special political figure uh, that you have repeatedly telling people that, look, I understand where you're coming from, I understand what your issue is, that's not the role of the government, right? It's harder to do that, I think, sometimes, than it is to swipe money from the tax paying oh, citizen it's a lot harder. to do the thing, <laughs> yeah. right? Is yeah. to, to explain to people, hey, I feel you. I know that you're going, because oftentimes people are coming at you with problems mm -hmm. that they want you to solve. And it's hard yeah. to look at those folks. All of us want to make people happy, right? But what a good decision maker does is he doesn't just look at what's right in front of him and the intended good outcomes. He has to look far beyond that and say, what are the long-term unintended destructive consequences of this particular policy? Every time we spend tax dollars on something, what that means is we're depriving people who we took that money from of that money. So if we're going to do it, it better be something that's really good and it better be something that benefits everybody to the most possible extent. Mayor Jacobs, thank you so much for spending some time with us. I don't, I, I don't normally get people coming to look at the window. They've been doing that because, you know... Oh. Kane's in the building, so that's a, that's a nice thing. I love that. We're It's kind of like the zoo here then, isn't it, you and me? <laughs> well, <laughs> you, you, you're probably a lot more yeah. used to that than I am. Thanks, man. I appreciate having uh, me on. And Mayor Glenn, thank you so much. Glenn Jacobs joining us for the better part of the hour. It's 1253 on Supertalk 99.7 WTN. Thanks, brother.
Hey, folks, Matt Murphy here for PAI Medical. I love this group of folks. They're good people over in Brentwood, and they can help you with your hair loss needs. Gentlemen, if you want to look better and feel better about yourself, and it's so much to feel better, I'm telling you the confidence level that you get, knowing that you're not losing, you're actually growing. It can be, this can be the time, this can be the season, this spring and summer, where you get your hair back. It's Matt Murphy for We Grow Hair, the only company that I will recommend to the state of Tennessee and the only company to have PAI's multi-unit hair grafting procedure. So if you are at a distinct disadvantage in terms of where you are in hair loss, don't worry. This trademark procedure can give you more hair in one procedure, saving you time and money than anybody else in the business. No one else has this. It's backed by the only company that I would help, uh, trust to help my thinning hair. I went to them, and I went. they went put me through my paces, helped me understand what thinning hair truly was. That education alone was worth the visit. Uh, and then they said, you know what? You need our laser treatments. Those laser treatments provide uh, good good ability to prevent the thinning of my hair to make sure that I'm going to have a thick, robust head of hair for the rest of my life. 615-376-6010 is the telephone number. Give them a call. Tell them I sent you to We Grow Hair at wegrowhair.com or 615-376-6010 for We Grow Hair. Super Talk 99.7 WTN, it's 104. My name is Matt Murphy, and this is the Matt Murphy Radio Show. Thank you for being with us. Whatever time you're able to give, we're certainly appreciative. Just finishing up the Libertarian Lunch. A couple of small L Libertarians in studio for the Libertarian Lunch this time round as we welcomed in Mayor Glenn Jacobs. A lot of response on the Super Tax Line. By the way, Super Tax Line up and running. MembersNutrition.com Supertext Line at 615-737-9986. You can watch the proceedings at Supertalk TV. Supertalk TV brought to you in part by the FNM Bank chat line, and we appreciate those guys. And this portion of the Matt Murphy Radio Show is brought to you by U.S. Pest. More on those guys coming up in just a couple of minutes. Uh, we've got day two of jury selection in the Trump hush money trial, uh, which CNN apparently thinks is the only thing going on in the United States of America, and, and one would... I mean, I guess that's their modus operandi over at CNN. I don't, I don't see a lot going on except this. Uh, it's a dog and pony show. It's a mishmash of laws and uh, state and federal policy that has been put together for the design to prevent Donald Trump from winning an election, which is not the design of our judicial system then, yesterday, today, or, or ever, for that matter. Hello, Bell. You, um... Just for the record, you like that first hour when when I'm when I'm here with you when uh -huh. I'm producing. Yeah. We always have two small L libertarians. Well, I mean, I understand that. I feel I feel that we we collectively represent the show, and and so I I'll speak in the royal we from now on. If that you desire, was, uh, that was fun though. He was a very nice guy. Um, let me just uh, spend a moment of personal privilege on my show to tell you. And I had not intended to tell you this. I hugged him. Bell K hugged him. I do not. I have. We met. Twice. When did we go to Waffle House? That was, was in like a. That was like a. November. An, uh, yeah, I think so. Because it was. Of 2021. It was either November or really late October. Because it was about six weeks before you started. Before I started. So, no, no, no. Yeah, you're right. Anyway, go ahead. So. Let's just say November first. November first of twenty twenty one. That'll that'll be the day that we designate. I met Bell K. So I've known him one, two, you know, two and a half years. I don't believe I've ever seen you initiate physical contact with another human being. Love that man. He's a great human being. But Mayor Glenn Jacobs walked into the studio, or rather the control area, before he came into the studio. And I did not know he was in the control room because he was in a corner that I can't quite see. But I knew something was up when Bell K jumped from his seat, removed his headphones, ran over, and then hugged him. Yeah. Hugged him. And I, and I told him since, you know, uh, Thomas Massey defended the Jones Acts, he is now my favorite politician. <laughs> so he's top of the heap now. And then he comes back a little while later during a break and said, hey, by the way, Sorry, but I couldn't help myself. 
I, I needed That's basically it. For, what I you needed said. it for the story. I ne- I want to be able to tell people that you I hugged. just ran up and hugged Kane. Yeah. Which I broke my promise. I, I accidentally called him Kane at the end of the interview. I tried oh, not he's to. he's so used to that. I know. I mean, that's such a huge part of his personal history. Well, too. I, you know what? He and I have a relationship exterior to that. And I, I'm not saying I'm, it makes me better or worse or whatever. I just, I don't follow wrestling. and I, so, I don't either. I'm much more interested in him as a libertarian who is actually in office. And actually acts like a libertarian yes. when he gets it. Yes, office. Absolutely. There are a lot of politicians that try to act like libertarians when they run for office, and they talk a good game. There are precious few of them, and I would consider Massey one, despite— Rand Paul. Rand Paul is another, uh, and uh, Glenn Jacobs is yet a third. I'm, I'm sure that there are many, And, many and I more. consider him much more effective than those other two guys, because as mayor in a town, he can facilitate things much easier than a Massey can— as one out of 435, or ran can as as one out of 100? Well, I asked the question. He answered the question. There was no need to belabor the point. Uh, today was not the day that Mayor Glenn Jacobs was going to make any sort of definitive announcement about his next steps. But let me tell you, every time I speak of or to Glenn Jacobs, there is a gaggle of conversation around our discussion or around him regarding what he's going to do next in political circles in the state of Tennessee. And most people want him to run for governor. I think the only way that doesn't happen is if his wife is just like, honey, I don't, I, please no. Don't want to move to Nashville. Yeah. Don't want to do this, that, or the other. Uh, but he is, I, I believe him. And y'all can accuse me of being naive if you desire. And that's fine. That's fair. Because there is a danger in genuinely believing politicians, but he's one of the few that I genuinely believe he feels called to it. I want, you know what I want? And I'm going to get off on a rant. I'm going to put on my rant pants for a moment. What we need more of in politics in America today is the reluctant political figure, the reluctant politician. There is a scene. If you've not seen the miniseries, John Adams starring, um, Oh, what is his name? Paul Giamatti as John Adams. There is a scene that I think of often when I think of the type of political figure that I want in our lives in 2024. Not those that have their egos stroked by politics. Not those that use it as a way to engage in competitive back and forth. Not those that have a particular agenda based on perhaps a particular affiliation not those that want to do the bidding of lobbyists. Not those. Not I want the reluctant politician. The one that tells me it's the last thing they want to do, but they feel compelled by God Almighty to do it. And there's a scene in John Adams where John Adams is telling Abigail, right? Is that right? Abigail. Yeah, that's right. Martha Washington. I don't know what Thomas Jefferson's wife's name. John Adams' wife was Abigail. Yeah. John Adams is um, lying in bed with his wife. And he tells her that he has to go back to Washington, D.C. Now, obviously, for Abigail Adams, this meant life without her husband, first and foremost, Without her soulmate, uh, it means far, far more work for her because she's running the show in Braintree, Massachusetts in the absence of her husband. I mean, they had a life to lead. They had a farm to tend. But more than anything, it's the heartbreak of losing her husband for another series of months or years. And he tells her that he has to go back to Washington, D.C. She burst into tears. She's crying in bed, and he tells her that he had to do it, that he has to do it. He doesn't want to do it. We need more politicians like John Adams. We need more politicians that are loath to enter the arena, but they do so because of, well, because of you and because of me because of their belief in the United States of America.
We sure as hell don't have one of those in the White House today. This guy wouldn't know his butt from a hole in the ground if he had a compass and a flashlight to find it. Yet here he is. Here he is. Running America into the ground as we speak. And engaging in a series of lawfare events in an attempt to dispatch of his political opponent for 2024 without actually having to meet him in the arena. Joe Biden cons consistently and, and with a, a fair degree of expectation lurches to the left, lurches to the left, lurches to the left. Forgetting the mainstream middle in America that Joe Biden and the leftist Democrats seem to have forgot. So it's a nice respite from all of that that we meet and we have a conversation with Mayor Glenn Jacobs. I don't know. For those asking, I don't, I don't know. I don't have any particular knowledge about what his future plans are. Uh, but I know that any time that we get around him, uh, many, many folks are very invested in the idea of him running for governor or at least some sort of future office. And we'll keep you up to date on that. Uh, the United States Supreme Court had a major decision yesterday, and I want to tell you about it. Uh, the court on Monday allowed Idaho to enforce its statewide ban on puberty blocking drugs, hormone therapy, and sex change surgeries for minors. The court, in a 6-3 to three decision, ruled that the law passed in 2023. This has an effect on the state of Tennessee, by the way because of the laws that we have passed preventing puberty-blocking drugs, hormone therapy, and sex change surgeries for minors. The court, in a 6-3 to three decision, ruled that the law may go into effect, although the, the state cannot apply it to the two plaintiffs who challenged the legislation. More on that in a moment. Uh, the court granted Idaho's emergency request after a U.S. District Court Judge B. Lynn Windmill, win, win, Windmill? Windmill, no D, Windmill, not like a windmill, it's W-I-N. Win, win, windmill. Judge Googly Moogly ruled that the state's government could not enforce the law during ongoing litigation and argued the measure likely violated what she saw as parental rights to decide the medical treatment of children. I'm going to apply this to something going on in the state of Tennessee being debated in the General Assembly as we speak. The Idaho state government has appealed the December ruling to the U.S. Circuit Court of Appeals. The body has yet to rule on the matter. So this is not a final say or a final decision. However, the Supreme Court ruled 6-3 to three that Idaho can enforce the statewide ban while this thing is being appealed. Three Democrat justices, Katanje Brown-Jackson, Elena Kagan, and Sonia Sotomayor, wrote that the court should uphold Windmill's decision while the other six held the injunction filed against Idaho was too broad and only applied to the two plaintiffs challenging the law. The two minors, referred to as Pam Poe and Jane Doe in legal filings, have both been receiving estrogen treatment. One has been prescribed puberty-blocking medication. Idaho is one of 24 states, Tennessee's another one, that have passed some form of legislation against sex change surgery for minors. 23 of those states have also prohibited puberty-blocking drugs and hormone treatment for children. Tennessee's one of them. While this ruling does not address the legality of statewide legislation banning sex change surgeries and procedures for minors, the court is set to decide whether the cases regarding similar statewide laws in Kentucky and Tennessee are legal in the coming weeks. The Department of Justice has spoken up about those two states' bans with Solicitor General Elizabeth Prey Lager writing in a filing that, quote, these laws and the conflicting court decisions about their validity have created profound uncertainty for transgender adolescents and their families around the nation. Now, there's, there should be some certainty here. And I want to back this up for a moment. And for those of you in Aniana, re-explain the situation. We've come to a point in the United States of America because we believe in freedom, and I do too. I mean, I... I default to liberty every time I'm considering whether or not a government edict should be written, an executive order should be followed, a law should be passed. Is this the job of government? How does it encroach upon individual liberty 
individual responsibility? Is it the role of government to initiate this action? What public health is being protected with this law? That is the standard that I start with. The only thing that these leftist, whack job, woke, nonsensical, sex change, transgender mutilation advocates have to argue is based on a statistical lie. We've talked about this in the past. Their entire argument about forcing or, I won't say forcing, allowing 13 and 14 and 15-year-olds, sometimes against the better judgment of perhaps even their parents, the only argument that they hide behind is this concept that if they do not, children die. The basic premise of the adolescent, juvenile, transgender mutilation surgery is that if you do not do this now, two things. Well, actually, I just thought of a second. Two things. One, they say, they claim that the adolescents will kill themselves. There is zero statistical data to back this up. As a matter of fact, it is being demonstrated as we speak through study after study that those adolescents that were predisposed to considering suicide were still predisposed to considering suicide after they began the puberty blockers, after they began the surgical procedures, because those things did in no way clean up the mental issues that existed prior to initiating these procedures. And as a matter of fact, what they do, the damage they do, they cause permanent damage to the individual body that can, be, can never be reversed. Never be reversed. The second argument being made by these transgender mutilation activists, number one is, well, they'll kill themselves if you don't do this. There's no statistical data, no statistical study that demonstrates that. When you force a political leftist or someone who advocates for these types of things to face that reality, they will hide behind anecdotal stories about this child or that child killing themselves as a way to try to force you emotionally to their side of the issue. And I refuse to do it. No one is suggesting that there is any fail safe that would prevent the tragedy of adolescent suicide in America. What we are suggesting is the harm of doing this, the harm of engaging in this way prior to the individual being able to make a mature and adult decision as to how they want to lead their lives. The finality of that decision making is far worse than the possibility that that adolescent is suicidal. It just is. Secondarily, before I, yes, Bell. I know this is going to sound sarcastic, but I 100% believe it. A trans child is like a vegan cat. We know who's making this decision. Yeah, that's right. A kid cannot have, does not have the understanding to be able to make that call. They And that child may have an adolescent desire to do things differently. And you see it all the time. But those That's things normal swing. for adolescents. That is normal for children. Some children are drawn, you know, some girls are drawn to be tomboys, but that does not mean that they want to be a boy. Although in today's society, being different and being treated differently is a very appealing prospect to young skulls of mush. And so they are drawn to those things that they can never possibly, as Bell put it, understand. A 12 and 13 year old child can never possibly understand the finality of the decision making, particularly when their brains are going to change 187 different ways in the next week. So what's the benefit 
to all of this? Well, they claim, the claim first and foremost was that it would prevent suicide, and I just destroyed that. I'll give you the second benefit that is claimed from transgender surgery, and I'll tell you who we had in town. Someone that claims to be a woman but hasn't undergone that transgender surgery, at least to my understanding, um, at Vanderbilt University earlier in the week. It's 122 on Super Talk 99.7 WTN. All right, friends, it's as simple as this. If you've not taken me up on the $149 offer for Craft Body Scan, I can tell you that offer will not be on the table forever, but it is on the table for the rest of the month of April. They have extended the deal because so many of you have responded to it. What is the deal? Well, it is a CT scan company. Craft Body Scan utilizes the most modern CT scan techniques to be able to look inside of your body to check out abnormalities or things going on that might be a little off. Long before you feel any symptoms, they can identify situations within the body. Detection early is key because you can blanch some of the most some of the worst of circumstances such as cancers within inside of the body and other issues. Heart and lung scan will cost you $149. They have full body scan options. They have colonoscopy options. That's right. There's a different way to get a colonoscopy through Craft Body Scan. Ask them about that when you stop by. Or give them a call and schedule your private health consultation today. They'll consult with you. They'll walk through it with you. They'll talk about some of your concerns. And then you're off to get your scan. It's non-invasive. You don't have to take off your clothes. It takes about five to eight minutes. And you'll get the results from one of their certified radiologists. You do not need a referral for this. You call, you make the appointment, and you go. And, oh, by the way, $149, which is a $1,300 value, bring a friend, and they'll do that friend as well. Craft Body Scan. Spell it with a C. CraftBodyScan.com or Hey, folks, it's Matt Murphy, and I want to tell you about a brand new sponsor to the Matt Murphy Show. I'm so proud to have them. It's U.S. Pest. U.S. Pest for all of your pest control and termite needs. I love this company, not just because they're locally owned, not just because they've been growing their company by leaps and bounds over the last several years, not just because they're the best in the business when it comes to pest control and handling your pest issues. This is the season, friends. The creepy crawlies are out, and I promise you this. If they're able, they'll get inside of your house. Whether it's termites or other bugs and whatnot, they'll get in there and they'll do the damage that they do, and they'll create creep you out, generally speaking, and we don't want any of that in our lives. Here's the deal. I want you to go to uspest.com. That's uspest.com and find out the U.S. Pest difference. Schedule a free estimate today. Termite control, they'll handle it. Pest control, they've got you covered. Here's the number, 615-590-1260. Write that down. You'll need it at some point this spring or summer. 615-590-1260. 590 -1260. 1260. It's the one and only U.S. Pest online at uspest.com. Ooh, 14. Super Talk 99.7 WTN. Matt Murphy Show. So a big Idaho Supreme, or rather, 
I should say, a Supreme Court ruling, say it right, Murphy, a Supreme Court ruling regarding Idaho being one of the 24 states passing some uh, type of legislation, and they're all a little bit different, against sex change surgery for minors. Minors. Um, we have this same type of ban here in the state of Tennessee. I'm not above being challenged on this issue. And I would invite you, if you feel like you have another legitimate reason why someone under the age of majority, under the age that we assign for individuals to be able to make adult decisions, then I'm welcome to hear it. I'd, I'd love to hear it. 615-737-9986. 615-737-WWTN. Call me. Super text me on the Members Nutrition Super Text Line. Disagreement goes to the front of the line. I'll get right to your call. I'll give you all the breadth in the world to explain to me why it's so important that we make a permanent decision about an individual's body because they claim that they know what they want for the rest of their lives at the age of 13 or 14. We had a membersnutrition.com super texter saying, when, I was, when my, uh, my kid was four years old, he walked around acting like a cat. I'm not going to teach my child to use a litter box because of it. Well, and that's an easy way to understand what's going on here. So you don't – no. by the way, I'm not denying that there are cases, legitimate cases of gender dysphoria. There are. But I don't believe you should make any permanent life-altering decisions in those genuine cases either before – an appropriate age. And here's here's the interesting thing. The two justifications were as follows. One, they, they claimed that the suicide rates were higher amongst those adolescents that did not receive this type of, quote, gender-affirming care. That's what they call it, gender-affirming care, quote, unquote. And those statistics do not exist. There's no legitimate study that demonstrates that the suicide rate amongst those that get the procedures go down while the suicide rates for those that do not remain high. None. Number two. And this was an argument that was created out of the fact that no one could initiate a study to demonstrate what they claimed to be true was true. They've been making this claim for years without any statistical study to back them up. And so they came up with number two. Well, Murphy, they'll say, it's very important that we block some of this action going on inside of the body before these individuals go through, fully go through puberty. Well, that's found not to be true either. Because for those individuals that are truly gender dysphoric, they actually, based on, and I don't mean to get too technical or graphic here, but based on the way that we do sex change operations, you need those parts to be fully developed in order to be able to have the sex change operation that you claim that you want. So the, think about this for a moment. Walk me through this gross, nonsensical analysis. They claim that you have to do it early in order to accomplish the sex change, but they prevent the accomplishing of the sex change because they do it early. Huh? It's almost like you just want to cut on kids and act like God. Isn't it? Let's get some of your thoughts on this in just a moment. It's 131. On Super Talk 99.7 WT. And David, you'll be first up. 615-737-9986. Now, when we return, we talked about Idaho and how this applies to the state of Tennessee. There's another piece of legislation that is running around the General Assembly. I don't know exactly where it is, but I expect it will be passed and it will be off to the governor very soon, if not today. And it would require school systems to report to parents if their children are identifying in a way that goes against their born gender. We'll talk about that next on Super Talk 99.7 WTN.
Super Talk 99.7 WTN, Matt Murphy, 137. I'm going to do this this way because the boss man, I call him boss man Dandis, has texted me. And he was, um, he was looking for a spot of information. And I think I will share that information with everyone. And hopefully Dan Mandis is listening. Because he's hearing the same thing I'm hearing on background from a number of General Assembly lawmakers regarding the fate of the education scholarship bill. Some are calling it a voucher bill. Some are calling it school choice, depending on your perspective. But let me recap what we talked about at the beginning of the show. It is my understanding that the school education scholarship bill is all but dead. It might have a little bit of life in it, but as I said at the beginning of the show, if it does come back to life based on what I have numerous sources telling me from the General Assembly, we're going to call it the Lazarus bill. Because it's really going to have to come back to life. So this is the impetus. In the House of Representatives, uh, there needs to be a certain amount of votes to get it out of committee. I'm told that Representative Jeremy Faison was a yes, is now a no. And without his vote, they cannot get it out of committee. And they feel like some of the votes have hardened enough that there's nothing that they can do. Now, I don't believe that there has been a vote yet, although... I don't know. I'm not down there, so I can't I can't say with any degree of certainty uh, when those votes are going to happen. But um, but we are being told I was being told last night and we're being told today uh, that for those of you concerned about the fate of the education scholarship bill, regardless of where you are on it, this is just the news for you that. Um, Representative Jeremy Faison voted no. He was amongst the members in the committee. Uh, that it needed to get through to uh, to kill the bill. So it, it's my understanding that it's dead. That's just an update on it. Wh- whether it remains dead or not remains to be seen. I am also told that there are individuals actively right now on the floor of the General Assembly, or at least within the body, trying to whip up votes, uh, trying to convert no's to yeses to try to push this through to include the governor's office to include the majority leader to include perhaps even the speaker of the house. I have not been directly told that Cameron is working it, but I would imagine that someone on that side is working it as well. A lot of you reacting to that. Todd says, wow, Phil Williams is a power. Phil Williams had nothing to do with the death of this bill. Let's not give Phil Williams any, Phil Williams tried to nip around the edges. Todd, come on, man. Phil Williams reported that lobbyists are going to lobby and reported that lawmakers are going to talk tough to groups regarding what they're trying to do with education. Um, I don't believe that Phil Williams flipped a single vote on this. I don't think that he turned anybody's opinion on this. I understand that Phil Williams is a pretty um, powerful investigative reporter. He turned political activist on this issue and seemed to have some motivation behind some of the reporting. Uh, 2528 says, sorry, Murphy, I know you liked it, but I'm glad it looks like it's dead. Yeah, no skin off my nose. My taxes don't change one way or the other. Um, I look for better educational opportunities for the people of the state of Tennessee. But truly, I had no direct skin in this game. Nor, and Todd, it's okay. Nor if I, uh, if I had a child, would I have skin in this game? Because let me promise you something. If, I, if I'm ever to have a child, I'm not trusting my child with government. Why would I do that? I, frankly, I'm of the mindset that I don't believe that it's the government's responsibility to educate your child at all. I think that might be your responsibility to educate your child. I think we have handed off far too much responsibility to the government of the state of Tennessee and the government of the United States of America to educate your children. And oh, by the way, if you're wondering... Let me connect two dots here for you. If you're at all wondering where the government gets off telling you that they have more responsibility for your children's raising than you do, if you're at all wondering where in the heck um, the government gets off telling you that you don't get to know as a parent, and this is being debated on the floor of the Tennessee General Assembly right now, 
that the school teachers that teach your children don't have to tell you when your child, who is formerly named Paul, wants everybody to call him Paula? And, and teachers say they don't have to tell you that. That if your if your twelve year old kid starts going to school and putting on a dress and demanding to be called Paula, and she and her instead of he and him, that the teachers say they have zero responsibility to tell you that that's going on. You don't think that you have a responsibility, or rather, a right to know that. If you're wondering why all of this is happening, it's because we've allowed the government to take control of our children. Now, that's a guy without any kids talking. Eighty-two, twelve. you're exactly right. They can't be in all of your business unless we allow them to be in all of our business. And we have abdicated so much responsibility to the government of the state of Tennessee and the government of the United States of America when it comes to raising our children. I was of the belief that this pulls a little of that responsibility back over to the parents and gives parents a little bit more opportunity to use tools in their toolbox to better educate their children and to take back a level of that control. Well... Apparently, the representatives of the people of the state of Tennessee, at least right now, are disagreeing. For those who just missed it, we are to understand that as it stands at this moment at 143 in the afternoon, that the education scholarship fund is dead. Are you on CNN? Representative Mark Green is currently talking on the well of the floor of the House. I think that's in the House of Representatives. No, that, that's in the Senate. He's, in they, the, they he's delivered delivering the, the articles yeah. of impeachment. Do you have it up? Uh, go ahead and, and uh, jip some of this. Join in progress. Ch Chairman of the Homeland Security Committee, Representative Mark Green. Well, then they're they're pulling away from that, so we'll pull away from them because. So last is he? Do. Is is he delivering these remarks since it's his committee that are that wrote up the articles? I I presume that's the, that's how it's handled. Yes. Okay. So yeah, so I, Representative Mark Green, as chairman of the Homeland Security Committee, where the articles of impeachment originated has the duty and responsibility. And I'm just assuming here, I guess this is written down somewhere, he has the duty to deliver said articles and is taking the opportunity to read said articles on the floor of the United States Senate. And I think that they're obligated to take it up. Well, Schumer's been saying he won't. In fact, Mike Lee's been calling him out over it. Which I don't understand because Schumer more than likely has the votes to acquit him. So why wouldn't you just do it? Because and, you have to have the trial. No, well, that's what I'm saying, though. It's like you have to have the trial. Why would you argue against that when you've got the votes to acquit the man? Well, I understand because it would it would showcase the failures of the Biden administration and their Homeland Security Department. So uh, I guess the answer to that would be uh, that you you don't want to make it impossible for ABC, NBC, CBS and CNN to not cover something. And it will be such a spectacle of tragic and disastrous proportions. The spectacle of what truly is going on at the southern border will be so present in front of the American people that I don't believe that they could avoid covering it. And any coverage of the southern border disaster, any coverage of the tragedies that exist because of the failures of Alejandro!
Yes. Is bad for the Biden administration. And the mainstream media outlets are all in on that. And Schumer knows that. So while, yes, Bell, he has the votes to acquit, I don't think you could get anywhere near the 60. I think it's 60. Yes, yeah, 60. Or is it 67? No, it's, 66. it's 66 or 60. Yeah, it's it's a super. It's, it's a a super two thirds. Yeah. It's two thirds. Yeah. Well, I think that's 67 or 66. 67. You will not get anywhere near those votes. <clears throat> he does not want to give the opportunity to present the record. And that's all it is. Presenting the record in front of the American people would be disastrous for Joe Biden. Which I guess is Mark's whole point is just to get all this on the record. Right. Right. 615-737-9986 if you'd like to be on the record as well. 615-737-WWTN would love to hear from you. 0397 says you need to jip via C-SPAN. That's probably true. I happen to be on hashtag. I, you know, I promise I commit to watching this garbage so you don't have to. So I try to do it. I try to do double duty during the show on a regular basis. Um, we will get back to the piece that's in the General Assembly in the state of Tennessee in just a moment. Kathy doesn't want me to say Alejandro Mayorkas' name like that anymore. I, I, I don't know, Kathy. I have a lot of people that seem to like it. But I could be convinced otherwise. It just reminds me, Alejandro, it just reminds me of someone yelling goal. And I think, frankly, I think Alejandro Mayorkas has the interest of Central and South America on his mind far more so than he does the interests of North America, or more specifically, the United States of America. So I have a tendency to do it that way. That one's on me. 149. Super Talk 99.7 WTN. Hey, folks, it's Matt Murphy. Efficient Heating and Cooling wants to talk with you. Whether your AC is not working in the afternoons and you need it this afternoon, it's getting up there, or you're not bumping that heat on in the morning because that heat isn't working like it should, it's time to call Jeff Eddy and Efficient Heating and Cooling. If your heater's not ready, if your AC is not ready, call my man Jeff Eddy and allow him to come out. You'll never pay more than $125 on a maintenance call, no matter how many units you might have. Uh, as uh, he doesn't believe in charging you an arm and a leg uh, to protect those systems. It can be hard to find someone you trust when it comes to your large home repairs, and Jeff Eddy is that guy. Efficient Heating and Cooling, they're a small company with big service and big results in mind. I trust the man, Jeff Eddy, with my home, and I believe you can trust him with your and, and as a matter of fact, I know that you can trust him with yours. They're a diamond contractor with Mitsubishi Electric and Elite Pro Partner with Ream. Make no mistake. When it comes time to replace, they're your go-to folks to replace your unit. EfficientHVAC.net is the website. EfficientHVAC.net. This spring and summer, if the AC is not working right or if you've not maintenanced yet, it's time to call Jeff Eddy. And Efficient Heating and Cooling, 615-784-4424, 784-4424.
Super Talk 99.7 WTN. I had no idea, at least based on the membersnutrition.com super text line, the most, one of the most controversial things that I apparently do is pronounce Alejandro Mayorkas' name in the way that I do. There are a lot of strong feelings about it, one way or the other. I think the, the majority want me to keep it. Some people are suggesting that uh, it's a little difficult to handle with Bluetooth and earbuds. Okay. Duly no Maybe if I did it softer. You know what I mean? I, 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 I mean, I'm stuck on the fact that we have better things to worry about when it comes to him than how to pronounce his name. I mean, I could do it like more low key. I just um, I want a job like his where you can just screw up and get paid six figures. Well, it's not a matter of screwing up, and and uh, for those of you, well, say, you don't have to do it correctly, is well, what I mean. Well, I mean, it, he I think is intentionally going against the basic rules of the road when it comes to his job. What is his job as Secretary of Homeland Security if not to protect the homeland, secure the homeland? He is choosing. Not to do that. As a matter of fact, he is actively doing the opposite. It is a tragedy that more Americans don't recognize this. All of you, most of you do. Some of you perhaps think of it differently, but I don't know how anyone could defend his policies. I don't know how anyone could truly defend him. For years, these people told us there was no southern border crisis. For years, people like Alejandro Mayorkas and Kamala Harris, who, who remains, to my knowledge, the border czar. Got to have a czar. Oh, no, the border's secure. Oh, no, the border's secure. Now the estimates that we hear is that there are 9 to 10 million. It, it's, it's almost hard to fathom. 9 to 10 million people are in this country illegally that previously were not here thanks to the refusal to secure the southern border by the Biden administration and Alejandro Mayorkas. Is there any wonder that you have the Golden Gate Bridge shut down by groups of people screaming death to America? Is there any wonder in the city of Chicago you have death to America being chanted while these individuals burn the American flag and no one says anything about it? But what, where is the outrage on mainstream media about massive groups of people screaming how much they hate the United States of America? By God, and I mean that intentionally, if you hate this country so much, we will assist you in your effort to leave it. Am I the only one that experiences rage when I see these people? who come and suck the benefits of this country dry only to suggest how much they hate it and want to destroy it? Are you kidding me? One-way ticket to nowhere, baby. To nowhere. Automatic. Oh, you screamed death to America. Did you mean it? Yes. Goodbye. Goodbye. I don't care what you do. Put them on a boat. I don't care what you do with them. I do care about this. It's time for Mac Mori and the newscast on Super Talk Down to Down 7 WTM. Two o'clock, I'm Mac Morey with your top stories. Currently 84 degrees in Nashville. Bit of a breeze. Got showers and storms possible later on this evening. Weather forecast coming up in two minutes. Today, as the articles of impeachment head to the Senate, Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas, the subject of that impeachment, urging Congress to approve more funding for his agency. Mayorkas says that the DHS has been tireless in stemming the influx of migrants at the southern border, but that a lack of funding and resources has led to a backlog of asylum cases. During testimony before the House Homeland Security Committee, Mayorkas said that the bipartisan Senate immigration deal, which never came to a vote in the House, 
would have adjudicated immigration cases quicker and streamlined the process to take care of migrants at the southern border. It would take a multi-year asylum process and reduce it to as little as 90 days or even less. That is a game changer in terms of deterring illegal migration to our border. Meanwhile, the chair of that committee on Homeland Security and Tennessee Representative Mark Green had this to say about Mayorkas today as they sent those articles of impeachment to the Senate. Mayorkas, in violation of his oath to support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic, to bear true faith and allegiance to the same, and to well and faithfully discharge the duties of his office, has willfully and systemically refused to comply with the federal immigration laws in that. Throughout his tenure as Secretary of Homeland Security, Alejandro N. Mayorkas has repeatedly violated laws enacted by Congress regarding immigration and border security. And that is the latest news. Weather forecast next. I'm Mac Maury, WTN News. USS stands for United Structural Systems. United Structural Systems, as I've told you many times, has been keeping homes stable and dry since 1994. As a matter of fact, well in excess of 25,000 satisfied customers believe in USS, United Structural Systems. The testimonies are abundant. I mentioned that Brad wrote in uh, from Nashville that they had two sidewalks that had collapsed on their campus, uh, created a trip hazard, and was a concern uh, regarding ADA. Uh, Brad placed a call to USS, and he, I'm quoting him here. Uh, the process was quick, the communication excellent, from the first call to the last day of completion. Evan came out and completed our work, and the sidewalk is now within compliance. The trip hazard has been eliminated. They saved us thousands of dollars having to replace the two panels on the sidewalk. Also, when they left, the work site was neat, clean, no evidence that they had even been there. As a director of facilities, USS is a partner you need in your contact list. Cannot recommend them enough. Thank you, Brad. Thank you from USS, and thank you from all of us who believe in the way that USS does their business. In Middle Tennessee, Southern Kentucky, within the sound of my voice, you owe yourself a call to USS if you have foundation or waterproofing issues. Call them today at 615-488-7855. 615-488-7855. They guarantee their best at USS. Super Talk 99.7 WTN. A couple of programming notes as we begin our final hour on this Tuesday edition. It is 2.05. Good afternoon. Hope you're doing well. Hey, look, one of the jurors in Manhattan was dismissed because they had a post on their social media platforms calling for Trump to be locked up. Huh. Well, I figured the DA would have been all for that one. I bet they were. You know, I learned from our good friend Jay St. Clair. We'll talk to Jay on Friday on that edition. I learned from him. 
years and years ago. You know, you don't seat a jury. You don't seat a jury. You know what you do to a jury? You strike a jury. That means that you take a group of people and you eliminate them until you have 12 left. Plus alternates. Sometimes, depending on how long you think the case will run, those alternates can be, you know, I, I want to say, if my memory serves me correctly, during the during the O.J. Simpson trial, they had like... That's exactly where my head went to. I think they, they ended up replacing like four of them. I think they had six or eight alternates. Yeah. And as an alternate, you sit there as a juror, and you know you're an alternate, but you have to pay attention. In case you get called up, you have to right. You then, have to you have to be up to speed. They can't start things over, and so they'll have to get some alternates for this case too. But um, yeah, you you, and eliminate. you can sit through that entire trial as an alternate and then have nothing to do at the very end. Of well, it. that's right. You don't, and I don't think uh, I think I'm right in this. And those of you who know, I've never I've never had the pleasure of serving on a jury. Have you been called to jury duty? The one time that I got called to jury duty was in Dallas. And it was the week after I was moving, so I didn't have to, I was moving to Atlanta, so I didn't have to go to jury duty. You know, most people believe that we, as talk radio show hosts, would be automatically dismissed from any sort of jury pool. I don't think that's the case. I know the one time that I was called to jury duty, I went to, I came from Montgomery to Birmingham, Alabama, and I worked for a different company other than Cumulus. And after five years, I was, they changed formats on me and I was fired. And I had been, I, I was out of work for like two months uh, before I got my job at then WAPI for Cumulus Broadcasting. And then, you know, here 20 years later, or whatever it is, here I am in Nashville on Super Talk 997 WTN. That said, um, it was during that time that I was unemployed that I got called to jury duty for some reason. And so I went in, and I was sitting in this huge room with a bunch of other people. This was just my experience in Jefferson County. And they asked if anyone has a reason why they do not believe that they can serve for the next week or several weeks. Because they don't know which jury you're going to be on at that point. You could be on, you know, a murder trial that could go, you know, several weeks. If there's anyone that believes that they have a legitimate reason, please come up and see this judge. And there was like a judge standing. I mean, he was in a suit, but. And there was a long line formed and he was, you know, moving people right or left. And I got to him and I said, I'm currently unemployed and I'm waiting on a job interview, which is true. And he said, you're dismissed. Thank you. Really? Yeah. You did you was the job interview set? No, I was waiting on a call back to set a time for the interview. And he's st- wow. That's I would have expected the exact opposite. Where he, he would have been like, "Oh, yeah, you're you, perfect. You this. got nothing to do. <laughs> you're on board." <laughs> I mean, I was, I was prepared to serve on the jury. I was just being honest with him. I said, "Look, I I don't know." I, if you had said, "Hey, I've got a, a job interview this date," I I could see him going, well, "Well, all right, you know, obviously you need to get work." But when it's up, still up in the air, it's, uh, it surprises me. Well, one way or the other, we're seating a jury in the Trump trial right now as we speak. Uh, The judge apparently, apparently the judge is like admonishing Donald Trump not to mutter. (laughs) I don't know why that makes sense. I will not have any jurors intimidated in the courtroom. (laughs) Intimidation is only for the defendant. he's He's telling... He's telling Trump that he can't mutter or mumble under his breath because that's going to intimidate the jury pool. And I will not have any jurors intimidated in the courtroom. I'm telling you, he's gonna put he's gonna hold Trump in contempt at some point. This guy is. He he is not going to be able to help himself. I don't know, you might could say the same for Donald Trump. But the judge will not be able to contain himself. So it's day two of jury selection. Once again, you don't pick a jury. You pick who won't be on the jury, and you take what's left. Uh, That's important to remember. And let's talk about the concept of jury nullification. I have long said that if you find me seated on a jury, and you are before a judge, 
and we are trying you. And your charge is simple possession of marijuana. Congratulations. You just hit the lottery because I'm not convicting you. I'm not. I'm not going to send someone to jail for that. There are several other ways that I could explain jury nullification for you. But this is the easiest concept. Jury nullification is a thing. Um, some would suggest that it goes against the basic premise and tenets of the law of the United States of America. Here's what I would suggest. Our law, our legal system is not perfect. It's just the best that we've got going. And I defy you to show me one that is better. Our legal system believes in the premise that it is better for guilty people to go free than it is for innocent people to go to jail. Number two, our jury system depends on the jury's respect for the law. And largely speaking, I have great respect for the rule of law. But there are times when I will walk outside of that. And if I feel strongly, if I'm sitting on a jury, it is your job to figure out where I am on some of these cases if you are striking that jury. And if I'm on a jury and I feel strongly that what you are accused of doing does not merit a criminal charge, does not merit jail time, for example, then I, I will not... If you don't think that there were several jurors because of their anger and frustration at the Los Angeles Police Department that nullified the OJ jury, you got another thing coming. Apparently, there were a lot of them on that jury, and several of them have since admitted it. There was an interview with a black female jurist who sat the OJ Simpson trial who said, I had no interest in giving a victory to the Los Angeles Police Department. And yeah, we figured that OJ did it. But you know what? So what? Said that. You can look it up. Don't believe me. There was no way that in that era, in that time, and at that place, that every one of those individuals, after they were seated, were going to convict OJ. And eventually, th those that wanted to and there were several that thought he was guilty they said to heck with it this is not worth it it's been nine months i am ready to go home and they threw their hands up in the island of manhattan it's a, a slightly different dynamic you will be hard pressed to find in an area where 90 percent of the voters are democrats and upwards of 90% of survey respondents say that they can't stand Donald Trump, how in the world would you expect for him to get a fair trial? Unless you have jury nullification. Let me tell you what I think the best case scenario is going to be for this trial. Did they put in for uh, to have the venue moved? Yeah, he tried to have the venue moved, and they refused him. Best case scenario is that you have one or two individuals seated on this jury that refuse to participate in this dog and pony show. And in that scenario, they'll nullify the jury. or Well, not even nullify the jury. They just will refuse to go along and they'll eventually hang the jury. 4231 says, I'm wondering what happens if they can't get a jury. They'll find a jury. It is not enough, by the way, and just a basic concept within the law. Some mistakenly believe that, like, you have to seat a jury that's never heard of Donald Trump before, and, that, and that's not the standard. You, you just do not, you have to demonstrate an ability to impartially judge the merits of the case based on the case and you cannot demonstrate partiality prior to the case beginning. You don't have to have a complete unawareness of the world around you. You can have an awareness about Donald Trump. But if you have strong feelings about Donald Trump prior to the trial beginning, odds are you're not going to be on that jury. Sally writes in and says Trump should start humming hail to the chief. <laughs> Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Hail to the chief. I'm the chief. I'm going to get you. I am the chief, and you better watch your steps. You. It's a little, uh, it's a movie reference from Jack Lemon and James Garner. 
It's where they were ex-presidents. Can't remember the name of the movie. Twenty six sixty six says that's funny coming from a judge who has himself shown bias and has strong faith. Well, I mean, obviously the whole case is just bathed in bias and and it is designed to get Trump. Uh, the design is not to win on appeal. I do not believe that there is a snowball's chance in Hades that this case wins on appeal. But that's not the purpose. The purpose is to get a criminal conviction. The purpose is to perp walk Donald Trump so that all the voters get to see it. The purpose is to affect an outcome of an election. It is what it is. Thank you, 9214. The movie is called My Fellow Americans, starring Jack Lemmon and James Garner. I think I'm right in that as ex presidents it's 217 mark is in white house talking about school choice which we believe is dead by the way if you're just joining us it is believed that the school education scholarship fund bill is doa in this session mark what do you think hey man thanks for taking my call i uh, missed you yesterday on the conversation but hey uh, i wanted to take you to task first of all let me just say i am very conservative um a couple of weeks ago, one of your callers called in, was against it, uh, and one of her points was is that you know it was put out there for all Tennessee parents, and you thought took exception to that and said it wasn't necessarily put out that way. And I would probably disagree with you. I think that it is put out that way that it's for all Tennessee parents, and um, you know, in fact, that's how. Uh, the, the one advertiser, the lady that's in trouble for whatever she supposedly did, the, you know, anyways, I think it, it was put out that way that it's for all Tennessee parents, and I, it's, it's not. And I'm going to say this, and I don't think I've ever said this before in my life, but it's, it's a tax credit for the rich. And, and let me finish, and, and it doesn't, it's not solving the problem. So what you, what I mean by that is is you got to pull the people, majority of the people that can't afford, even with a seven thousand dollar tax credit, can't afford a kid to go to school, uh, private school. Uh, you've got a larger pool of of uh, richer people, put it simply, that are already in private school, and those are the people that are going to get tax credits back. Then you've got a smaller pool of the people that are on the border, on the fence, that this will help them get their kids into a private school. So it's, it's a majority of the case is going to a tax credit to the rich who are already able to afford this. And let me, let me say, too, I put two girls through private school. Uh, I was fortunate enough to do that. So, you know, I'm not, I'm not you know, I, like I said, I thought I would never, ever say that, but that's basically what this is. And then what I'd say is that it's well, not what, solving the problem because you still got, but you still got, let me finish, and then I'll be quiet. But you still haven't solved the environmental, the environment problem. You're pulling some kids out. Some of these kids will come out, but that doesn't solve the remaining vast population of the kids that can't afford to go to well, high school. Doesn't I mean, I, solve, I, don't think it, I don't think it's the government's job, Mark, to make parents be good parents. And that's and that's what you're talking about. Uh, uh, you know, am I? I don't the, know. Yeah, I, the, the, I, I think the, not... the vast majority of the issues that we have in our public education system is because we don't have parents being good parents. I would argue that. And I wouldn't take exception to that. No. Um, no. As far as the 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 tales of the legislation, I mean, I. I mean, I could I could quibble over a couple of things, but I mean, I don't think there's a point in doing so because I think the legislation is dead. I mean, I would I would yeah. remind you, and you probably know this, that of the twenty thousand scholarships that were being offered, the first ten thousand of those scholarships were strictly need based, right? So yeah. that kind of goes against your concept that this is a welfare program or a tax credit for the rich. I'm, I had to put my phone on speaker. So oh, no, no, you're, you're, you're okay. I was, just, I was just saying that uh, it's uh, my understanding the legislation last I saw it uh, yeah. of the 20,000 scholarships, 
uh, the first 10,000 were strictly need-based, and the others could, in fact, be need-based as well. But the first 10,000 were set aside uh, as a need-based only scholarship. So at, certainly at the least the first half of those applicants would not be, quote-unquote, tax credits for the rich. Okay, then forgive me. No, no, no. I that's okay. That's okay. And that's what I mean. I mean, it's. I mean, look. I mean, I think I would never say that. I, I am, I am willing to listen to good people like yourself, Mark. Whether what what ideas that you might have to to solve the overall global issue of poor results within the public education system. I mean, is there anything that you can take? I mean, is there anything that you can think of that might go oh, to God. more of the heart of the matter? If if I had that magic seed or magic formula, I think I'd be, you know, rich at this point. No, I have, I have no clue. Um, I think I think you're right in that, you know, people that do want to send their kids to private school are more engaged and more involved. I would... I would say than people that don't, parents that don't. Well, and so and, and, I agree with your point that um, you know the the, the the schools can't be the parents. You know the the city can't be the parents. But I don't know what that answer is, and obviously no one does because it's not getting fixed. And you know, and throwing the money at it doesn't work i mean it's been proven time and time again that that doesn't work so you know i i don't know and I, I don't know but well, I, just, I, I i don't i don't either i i know that i believe in and thank you mark for the call thank you for the careful conversation and and i appreciate the this good conversation and i appreciate you mark I don't know that I have all of the answers either i know that we must infuse competition within the system to raise the level of educational opportunity that children are getting. I also know that we need to figure out something within the culture that would create an expectation that if you have children, that you are expected to raise those children in a responsible way. And I don't know how to do that, man, but that is the root of the problem in pub public education. If you want to know the biggest difference between public and private, private is competitive because you can take your money elsewhere. Public is not. You have to put your kid in that system. And largely, the people that are doing so don't have the money to put them kids, their kids into private school. Secondarily, the parents are more engaged because they have a financial investment. Well, and that's not the sole reason, but that's part of the reason. And it's 224 on Super Talk. Membersnutrition.com. Have you been there? Have you checked it out? What are you waiting for? Membersnutrition.com. It's as simple as popping in the website. I can do it as I sit here and talk with you today. Membersnutrition.com is a brand new sponsor to the Matt Murphy Show and to Super Talk 99.7 WTN. And they are brand new in this community, providing incredible opportunity for you to buy your vitamins, vitamins and supplements at a lower cost point than provided by the big box stores. I mean, it's just, it's kind of simple math. Uh, they are online. Uh, they provide their supplements online. And so they don't have the brick and mortar to pay for. They don't have the light bill to pay for at that brick and mortar and whatnot. And so they can offer you quality, high quality supplements and vitamins for less money than the big box stores. Secondarily, all of their product is made in the USA. That's important to me. I hope it's important to you as well. Not only do I like supporting American companies, I like knowing where my vitamins and my supplements that I'm putting inside of my body are made. I mean, who knows what's going on overseas? Who knows what's happening in China or India or wherever they're coming from? And I don't want that in my body. And so I buy from Members Nutrition. They have sports nutrition, relaxation supplements, men's health, women's health, weight management, anti-aging, energy supplements, all of their products made right here in the good old USA. So go to membersnutrition.com. Once again, membersnutrition.com and see the Members Nutrition difference. Membersnutrition.com.
Taking a look at the jury selection process in this Donald Trump court case and looking at possible legislation here in the Volunteer State, 230 Super Talk, the 97 WTN. Thank you, Mac Morey. Appreciate you. Have your, uh, you have your coffee cake yet? I or banana, b- uh, banana banana bread, bread or whatever the heck it is. Bread. I don't know what it. I don't know what it is. Oh, it's, I don't know it's what waiting it is. for me was, at home. It'll be uh, demolished. Tonight. Was told to give it to you. Uh, did we? Have, didn't we have something to give him hell about? I forget. I always not forget. being here at noon. Oh yeah, that's right. Not being. Oh, here not being here when I'm not scheduled. Gotcha. <laughs> okay, that, that, that makes sense. Matt <laughs> Morey shows up for the Chris Hand show finally. <laughs> Where is he on the Matt Murphy show? <laughs> oh, we can't find him. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Ma- uh, Mac. You guys today's wonder why I don't join in. Today's title was uh, Matt Murphy and Bell K on the job. Mac Maury slacking as usual. <laughs> yeah, there you go. You made the title, Maury. Congratulations. Yeah. You only show up for an hour of the show, but you still made the title. <laughs> That's nice. That's pretty good. That's well done. Well done by you. All right, two twenty nine. Super Talk ninety nine seven WTN. Guys, it's not dead yet. Okay. So I know that I've been saying that all of my sources tell me so. I'm being chided. I'm being admonished. There are fingers wagging at me in the Members Nutrition Super Tax line and otherwise that Lazarus is not dead yet or Lazarus could be brought back from the dead. So You're speaking out of turn again, sir. Maybe so, but I'm just telling you what I'm hearing. So the idea of school choice is not quite, I'm not, I mean, it's like Monty Python, right? Bring out your dead. Bring out your dead. But like I, we, I'm not like, dead yet. We were talking about this, uh, I think, late last week. They can still bring it back next uh, session. Oh, too. sure. Oh, sure. I mean, it obviously can come up in any future General Assembly. Bring out your dead. I'm not dead yet. But they oh, don't even, on. they wouldn't even have to refile because we're still inside of a session. You'll be dead by next Thursday. No, uh, this is the final year of the two year session. So oh, I do I think, it was, okay. I do believe that it has to. So they would have to refile. It has to start fresh and go back through committee again. Uh, more calls on this subject and others coming up on Super Talk 99 7 WTN. Here's Mac Moore in the news. Thirty minutes after the hour of two o'clock, I'm Mac Morey with your top stories. Eighty-four degrees, rain and storms possible later on this evening. And taking a look, still have issues over there on I-840 eastbound. This is between Carter's Creek Pike Highway 246, exit 23, and Columbia Pike Highway 31, exit 28. Traffic's being diverted onto Carter's Creek Pike for alternative routes. That's because an excavator hit a bridge, a support bridge. Over there on an underpass there near 840 while doing some work on some train tracks. It's not known when that roadway will reopen to traffic. Weather forecast coming up in just a couple minutes. Hundreds will be called, but only 12 jurors and four alternates will be chosen for the New York trial of former President Donald Trump. We're hearing from those who weren't chosen. Dave Packer. Kara McGee was called to the courtroom from the jury pool, but ultimately excused from the Trump case for scheduling conflicts. She says finding anyone without an opinion one way or the other about the former president may be impossible. I don't approve of of a lot of what he has done as president and a lot of what he has said. But McGee says... In order to do my civic duty, I, yes, I would be able to put aside my personal feelings about him. And adds that other potential jurors were taking their role just as seriously. And one juror just dismissed after posts were found on social media from them discussing, quote, locking up Trump. Right now in Tennessee, a bill is just one vote away from Governor Lee's desk that would require school districts to notify parents if their kids ask for action to affirm their gender identity, such as using a different name or pronoun. The New York Post reports more than 3.2 million U.S. public school students are covered by guidance that blocks parents from knowing whether their child identifies as a different gender in the classroom. And it could become federal policy if President Biden's Title IX proposals are approved next month. And that is the latest news. Weather's next. I'm Mac Morey, WTN News.
What used to be Mill Creek View, Tennessee, is now Heartland Journal, and I want you to be a part of it. Hey, friends, it's Matt Murphy for Steve Abramowitz and Heartland Journal. If you go online to heartlandjournal.com, you'll see everything that they have to offer. News, journal entries, and, of course, the ever-popular co- uh, podcast feature. They feature artists and entertainment fi- uh, figures, cultural touchstones. I mean, just uh, sports figures, anything you can imagine in the world of Tennessee they have, and of course, uh, they are frequently the number one podcast on politics in Tennessee on Potomatic and other spots. You can find them anywhere on the internet, on Rumble, on video, and you can find them at heartlandjournal.com. It truly does reflect what Steve is trying to do in the state of Tennessee, and he's doing a great job at it. It's heartlandjournal.com. You can also find me there on occasion uh, with my Murphy's Law segments on Heartland Journal. Heartlandjournal.com for more info. Heartlandjournal.com. Go see the podcast, the videos, the journal entries, and so much more at heartlandjournal.com. You want a um, you want a funny? By the way, there have been now six jurors seated in the Trump hush money trial. Six of the pool. So you you take everyone and you eliminate those and. If you can't eliminate them for any reason, you put them on the corner and you seat them uh, until you get to the number that you're looking for. And then there you go. So six have been now seated. Uh, That is an update from Supertalk 99.7 WTNs. 1239. what time did this start? Uh, It started yesterday. Oh, oh, okay. So they've gotten six. uh, They'll be done by the weekend. It's actually going a little bit further or a little bit quicker than most expected. I heard estimates of somewhere between a week and two weeks. To seat the jury. And and both the prosecutor and the defense have to agree on a juror to, to for them to be on it. Yeah, I mean, I could ask Jay about this. They have a, a certain number of strikes. There's a procedure, and it might change from state to state, but they have a certain number of strikes uh, that are allowable uh, for whatever reason. And then if there are legitimate reasons, that doesn't count against them. In other words, uh, we talked about I, – I think I'm right in this, and don't hold me to it, but I think I'm right in this – that if um, if you ask a juror a series of questions, hey, have you ever posted negative things about Donald Trump? And they say, yeah, I hate Donald Trump. Donald Trump sucks. That doesn't, no one has to strike that juror. That juror just okay, gets dismissed. See, yeah, okay. But then the prosecution and the defense have opportunities to strike a juror and they can do that for just about I think any this person's possible. lying about yeah. their love of Donald Trump right. and we don't want them on. Okay. Right, right. We don't we don't trust this one. This one we don't like. Uh we don't and and frankly, this is the most important part of the process. As my my good friend St. Clair has taught me over the years, the most important aspect of securing a guilty or a not guilty verdict is seating the jury. I mean, it's just it's 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 why you have individuals that go to law school and come out of law school and all they do is seat juries because it's such an important part of the process. Um, we'll get to your calls momentarily. By the way, this story, if you want a funny, this is good. This is what happens when government tries to be socialist. There is a lawmaker in San Francisco. And th- th- just laugh at this. It's amusing. It 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 just... San Francisco has become a communist nation. I mean, it really has. There's a lawmaker in San Francisco by the name of Dean Preston that has moved to protect his citizens by recognizing his constituents' needs. The San Francisco Board of Supervisors member has proposed the Grocery Protection Act. The board approved the initiative, but inevitably vetoed it, or it was vetoed by then Mayor Diane Feinstein in 1984. But it has now been re-upped for reapproval. According to Dean Preston's proposal, relevant authorities must receive a six-month written notice before a grocery store shuts down. The notice will be issued to the Board of Supervisors and the city's Office of Economic and Workforce Development. Notices must be posted at all acceptable grocery store points or all accessible, not acceptable, accessible 
grocery store points to, quote, properly inform customers and the general public. Even if a store is unprofitable, the six-month notice for closure stands. And if they do not do so, the city can sue the grocery store. What a bunch of clowns. <laughs> How about that? So they think you're in the middle of San Francisco. One of the most expensive cities in, in the country. It's it's becoming a food desert because you won't enforce the law. You won't enforce shoplifting you, uh, laws and all of that. And finally, a grocery store says, we can't do this anymore. We're unprofitable. It's unsustainable. Crime is rampant. We're shutting down. And now the city says that a private business does not have the authority to shut their doors when they want to. It's pathetic. It is a clown show. It is a communist nation on the left coast of the United States of America. Let's get back to your calls. Heather is next up. Heather, thank you for your call. How are you? Great as always. How are you guys? I'm well. Thank you. Love your show. You've been getting on it lately, and I really appreciate that because, you know, you don't mess around, and you get into people's, you know, ethics and, and ideas, and I, I think that's really something our generation really needs right now is somebody who's willing to dig in there and not just beat the microphone with words, but also engage with we're an, we're an interactive generation of, you know, the, the Gen X down is an interactive generation, um, and, and there's so much to be learned and, and, and so much to learn from each other that's been forgotten or twisted, and, and I'm really glad you guys are on the radio. Anyway. Thank you. Jerry, Thank you. you know, <laughs> um, the jury notification thing, I remember listening to a, a girl on a podcast a couple years back, and she kind of discovered the whole jury nullification process because she wasn't really um, comfortable convicting this person based on what he was charged with. And I remember her getting harassed. I think they even threatened to throw her in jail if she tried to nullify the jury. Like, they do not like that at all. And I wondered if you had any information on that. Yeah, I I don't I don't uh, is the short answer. I don't know what legal ramifications there might be for a juror uh, to determine. And, and and what we're talking about, uh, Heather, for those just joining us, let me catch everybody up. So jury okay. nullification is as simple as this: that I I can look at a defendant and understand that under the current law that that defendant is guilty of the crime being charged against him. But if I fundamentally disagree with either the crime itself being a crime or if I disagree with the punishment that I know that the individual defendant will receive as a result of a guilty verdict, I just choose to say, no, I'm not, I'm not doing this. I'm going to give a not guilty verdict in this case regardless of what I believe the defendant has done to break the law. Um, I, I don't know. I can find out what, if anything, the state can do. I know they hate it. I know they don't like it. I know that they believe that it is against the premise of the judicial system. I believe that it is a component of the judicial system that should not be taken lightly, should not be overutilized or overused. But at the same time, you know, I've, for a long time I've said, if, if you find me on a jury and they're trying to put somebody in jail for, you know, a simple, you know, dope possession charge i'm not i'm not having any part of it i think bell might have some info heather there are 24 states that have constitutional uh authorization for jury, jury nullification and the there's four additionals uh maryland indiana oregon and georgia they have provisions guaranteeing the right of jurors to judge or determine the law in all criminal cases well there you so go So there's 28 states that allow it in some fashion there I don't go. know if New York's won, though. There you go, Heather. Is Heather still there? I think we lost Heather. Heather, thank you for the call. Thank you for the kind words. I appreciate you. Let me try to get to as many as I can. Greg is in Nashville. Greg, what's up? Hey, I'm, you were talking about the possibility of um, uh, somebody hanging up uh, Trump's jury. I was on a rape trial one time, and there were four of us that hung the jury up, and one of the things that people have a hard time with when they're on jury is 
you know, the state has to prove their case. And I, it's like O.J. Simpson. I could have been on that trial and gave him a fair trial because I would have demanded that the state prove the case against O.J. Simpson. If they can't prove the case, then I'm not going to vote guilty. And in this case where, you know, the, the state was unable to prove its case against the defendant and I couldn't vote guilty. And so, you know, and the other lady was talking about losing friends and everything. I lost friends and everything else over that. Because, but, you know, it was an emotional situation. You know, I, I, the guy, you know, who somebody raped this woman violently and I, you know, he should have been hung, but I can't put an innocent man in prison. And if more people would just hold to that, which I think most Americans are not equipped to do, um, you know, it doesn't matter how biased I am toward a person if I'm on a jury, as long as I hold to that standard. No, I I, I appreciate everything you're saying at this. I mean, uh, Greg, I I understand uh, there there are times when I mean, it, well, let's put it this way: our judicial system is set up where guilty people go free before innocent people go to jail, and it is why you are allowed to have unreasonable doubt but you're not allowed to have reasonable doubt and if it is up to the prosecution to demonstrate the guilt of the individual accused and even if you in your heart of heart if you're in your heart of hearts believe the defendant probably did it that's not enough the state has to prove to you beyond a reasonable doubt. That's such an important. Now, what's the key word in that sentence? Reasonable. Reasonable. And reasonable people have different definitions of what reasonable means. So that that's that's the rub. Ours is not a perfect system, but as has been famously said, just show me one better and I'll take it up. It's 250. We'll take it up with Brian Wilson coming up in just a moment on Super Talk 99.7 WTN.
Super Talk 99.7 WT. And one final note, a story I wanted to get to today. We'll be unable to cover it in depth. China, it is now being reported, something that we all have felt we know, we've we known, it has been subsidizing and uh, the manufacturing and exportation of illegal and illicit fentanyl precursor chemicals and other synthetic narcotics through tax rebates and other means. That is according to a newly revealed uh, report by the House Select Committee on Chinese Communist Party. In other words, we now know that the Communist Party is in part funding moving these chemicals to areas where the, it is then manufactured into fentanyl and moved across the southern border. But, of course, we all knew that that was the case. Brian Wilson joins us from The Drive to talk about some of the things coming up this afternoon from 3 until 7. Hello, Mr. Wilson. You know how some days it seems like, well, there's just not a lot going on? Th this would not be one of those days. <laughs> no, sir. Uh, impeachment no, sir. articles have been delivered to the uh, Senate. Uh, the Supreme Court conservative justices questioning how the Department of Justice uh, applied the law in January 6th cases. Huge implications there. Speaker Johnson in deeper trouble. Is he about to be removed as speaker? And then closer to home, a hearing on the, whether or not the, the writings of the Covenant shooter should be made public. And add uh, to the uh, list of things that we've got going on on our show, Senator Marshall Blackburn will join us at 530. So a lot going on. Man, oh, man. And, you you know, you add to that. I know that you have your uh, ear to the ground with regard to General Assembly activity. I, right. I have now named the education scholarship bill Lazarus because I feel like it, in order for it to survive, it kind of has to come back from the dead at this point. Well, let's see. I mean, it's always remarkable how things can come together at the last moment if there's motivation to get something across the goal line. And the governor... Uh, has has continued to say he thinks that it can happen. So we'll we'll look into that as well. There's I mean it's just like it's like drinking water out of a fire hose today. <laughs> we got way too much stuff to talk about. So stay with us. We'll kick it off here in just a few minutes after the news. Brian Wilson in control of the spigot, and he will uh, handle that with professionalism and a plum this afternoon from three until seven o'clock on Super Talk 99.7 WT. And before we get to Brian Wilson in the drive, it's Mac Morey's turn in the newsroom. News now. We'll be back tomorrow at about high noon. Until then, hug your loved ones, folks. Have a great afternoon. So long, everybody.